Hi everyone. Uh, I'm here today with Namrita Bali, Director and Strategy Advisor for Self-Employed Women's Association Seva. Herself specializing in handicrafts, you know, she organizes handicraft projects for urban and rural women and has also presented many papers nationally and internationally, you know, regarding working class women in the country. And she's also a board member of multiple foundations and undoubtedly one of the most vital personalities in the progress of women in the country. Thank you so much, ma'am, for making time for us today. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you. So without further ado, uh, how did your journey with Seva begin in the first place? Um, well, thank you, first of all, for uh, approaching me and uh, the program that is going to be on the 16th. Um, coming to your question of uh, how did I start this journey? Uh, actually, it was, you know, I was studying in Baroda and my specialization was in textiles. And um, as a student, I had to do some internships. And like all students, you know, we try to find some place where we can go and try our skills and our education. So because I was in Baroda, I chose Ahmedabad City and I chose Self-Employed Women Association because their membership included a lot of textile workers. And were these textile workers uh, who were all women, uh, all self-employed, uh, some of them had been organized into cooperatives, but some of them were organized as Seva union members. And the skills that they had were like block printing, applique work, weaving, um, and uh, in embroidery, of course, like if you know Gujarat, we have a lot, lot of kinds of embroideries depending on the ethnicity and the groups we come from. So when I came here for my intern, uh, something uh, really touched my uh, my soul you can say my head and my heart that this was something really different i mean as a textile student uh, we are exposed to many kinds of work some of them can be really very very exquisite they can be boutique work they can be you know uh, glamorous also at some point of time but when i came here and i was working with very poor women and in fact, I had to unlearn many things that I had learned in a university. And I saw the kind of knowledge and wisdom the poor people had. And uh, they're, coping, they're coping up kind of a, you know, personality, which, uh, which was uh, very much seen because while I was working as a textile worker with them, uh, Ahmedabad city had riots. They were Hindu Muslim riots. And from a textile worker, I became a relief worker. And I had to go and work in neighborhoods uh, where these workers were living. And that was actually the turning point in my life when I, you know, coming from a very different background uh, with very different kind of exposure, when I saw the reality of life and how, you know, people who from very little, little resources, they had built upon something and they lost it just you know, one day. Whereas they were very, very skilled at the same time. And uh, this uh, simultaneously, I would also like to tell you a story that while all this was going on, I went to work with a weavers community, which was in the rural areas. And I'm not a Gujarati. I mean, I used to speak Hindi, but uh, when I went to the villages, I had to start learning Gujarati. And I could only learn the language by living with them. So while I was doing that, on one side, we had the Ahmedabad city people who had gone through riots. In the rural areas, it was a drought year. Uh, there was no rainfall for some time. And all these very skilled weavers had become uh, relief workers, you know, like they were digging mud and making mm. uh, uh, kind of, you know, uh, roads or they were repairing the roads or they were making, recharging the wells by digging mud out of it. And I used to feel so sad. I would say that you're such a skilled person, you know, you can weave so much so beautifully, but you have become a relief worker. 
so uh, and and you know their children would be running around there and a very you know different kind of uh, uh, value system at that time i would say why are your children running around like this why are they not going to school why don't you you know give them proper nu nutrition or whatever and you know, there was this balu ben she was a very i mean she used to do a lot of weaving very beautiful weaving and she told me she said sister you know here everybody is called ben so she said sister she said uh, what you say is like music to my ears it's very beautiful it sounds very beautiful but when you have a hole in your stomach your brain does not mm. work so from that day onwards i stopped you know uh, giving whatever learnings i had and i started listening to them and mm. i think these two incidents in my life in 1985 uh, were the two incidents one was when i saw the skilled workers being affected by hindu muslim riots and the second one when they were uh, affected by the natural disaster so one was a man made disaster the other one was a natural disaster and how these they, how these skilled artisans you know uh, how they suffer but yet their uh, courage and their coping mechanisms are mm. uh, great yeah mm -hmm. and, and that's when i decided that uh, once i complete my studies this is the place where i'm going to be mm -hmm. so like you mentioned you know you started as a relief worker and then at, you joined seva and from there you've been the secretary as well and then you know uh, the director now you are the director and the non strategy advisor as well so you know you've brought yourself up from a certain point to a big platform now so what kind of challenges did you have to face throughout that journey well it's been a very long journey more than 30 years 35 years and i think uh, every every thing we did was a learning experience um uh, within the seva family that is the self employed women association i have had various positions i mean i started as a organizer uh, working with the textile groups organizing them into cooperatives because you know the seva philosophy is that as you know as we are poor we are very vulnerable but when we come together uh, as a collective our strengths mm. increase and that is why uh, we used to believe and we still believe in making member based organizations and member based democratic organizations are like cooperatives or uh, you know uh, women led women owned women managed kind of uh, companies and organizations so that was my biggest task and i think i learned a lot over there you know how women uh, i mean of course we had the privilege of uh, some kind of education and we had that kind of you know privilege of uh, uh, being exposed to certain things but here they were illiterate semi literate women of course they have a lot of wisdom they have a lot of knowledge but uh, uh, but the scientific knowledge i mean which only you get in a mainstream school or in a mainstream academic institution that was not available to them for various reasons so here the challenge becomes that you know how it's a very slow process because uh, uh, you know you're working with a group uh, and um, uh, you take any kind of thing i mean you take the organization or you take their skills every day is a competitive day every day is a competitive day so you have to start from very very i would say uh, micro planning you know you have to start with very small things uh, but dream big you know you have to be very ambitious but start with small start with very basic things and that was my biggest uh, learning and from an organizer then i became a coordinator and then uh, i was also the secretary of seva i was the general secretary of seva member of their core team um, uh, which is the you know the team which makes all the kind of decision the policy decisions and helps the other executive committee members to make certain decisions of course a strategy advisor because once you know you gain a certain position uh, you become associated with other networks so then you become a kind of an advisor to other networks so in the strategy advisor position i am a strategy advisor for home net south asia which is another kind of a network but uh, within the seva family uh, 
uh, after having all these positions, I think my biggest, I would say, uh, the milestone was uh, when, uh, you know, I mean, like I said, you know, we think big and uh, we do very micro planning, but our dreams are big. We, uh, and we always think uh, that uh, why not, you know, if it's available for everybody, then why not for women? Why not for the poor? And that is why when Ila Ben, our founder, who just passed away a month back, uh, you know, she had this big dream that we have a university for poor people, and especially a university for poor women. Ask yeah. about that, like what milestones and achievements that you're most proud of? Yeah, so it was like in 1990 when uh, Seva was really expanding, not just, you know, in numbers geographically and, you know, it had become like a movement. It was a women's movement. It was a union movement. It was a cooperative movement. And that's when Ila Ben, our founder, you know, she had this uh, big dream of having a university for the poor, especially university for the poor women. And she... Uh, when she sat with us and with the members, with the women members, uh, we wanted something which would give them all possible that is available in a mainstream university, but which would be, which would have the values and the mindset and the, you know, uh, skills which the members want. So the faculty would be for them, from them. And, and so we started this journey. It was a learning experience in the beginning. It took us 10 to 11 months because our background was not academic. Uh, we were more like, you know, designers. And, uh, but, uh, but then, you know, as it was all trial and error. And, and that's how the whole academy, uh, I mean, of course, we wanted to have a university, but then we were suggested with, uh, with you know, some friends of ours, uh, supporters, that uh, you will lose your flexibility if you get into the university culture, but it's better to have an academic. So we named it Indian Academy for Self-Employed Women. And the main, uh, the main objective was to train or to build cadres of grassroots leaders. So that's the main objective of uh, Seva University, or I would say the Indian Academy for Self-Employed Women, to build cadres of grassroots leaders. And our philosophy, the mantra over there is that every person has knowledge. Nobody is unuseful. So you have to believe in that. It's just that you have to give the opportunity and you have to become a good organizer to give them that which has been lost somewhere. And the second most important thing that we learned over there was in those days itself, in the 1980s, actually in the 1980s itself was that technology um, uh, can be handled by the poor, by the illiterate, by the semi-literate, if they are given the opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, so, which of course, now we all are using technology. You know, after the COVID-19, like everything became so very techy and everybody was using all kinds of uh, uh, mobiles and laptops and computers for their little businesses, small enterprises and for communication. But way in, you know, the late 80s, uh, we uh, started giving technology in the hands of the women especially. And uh, I mean, they were illiterate women, they, but they started using very sophisticated technology. I mean, in those days, uh, videography or photography uh, or having those big cameras, you know, uh, it was only with some people, but here they were women. And, you know, the women said, oh, if we are head loaders, if we can take so much load on our head, why not a video camera? So, mm. uh, and it's our eye which can, you know, see what we suffer, how we are exploited. And we want, uh, uh, we wouldn't say history, but her story, the her story of women to be documented. So that's how, you know, the Academy started in 1991. And it was one of our biggest milestones to have a university for the poor women. And today mm. it's almost like, you know, more than 30 years again and uh, has trained more than uh, you know 10 lakhs of women members and uh, we recently had a felicitation program like you know all universities you have a convocation program 
So we had a convocation for some of our leaders, some of our grassroots teachers, our grassroots researchers, our grassroots techies, and grassroots designers who actually uh, uh, they came, they went through the whole process. And today they are managing their own organizations. They are managing their own enterprises. They are leading the organizations. They are representing their organizations. They are making decisions for their organization. So that is, I think, one of our biggest milestone. That if you invest, I mean, of course, a lot of people said, you know, uh, what is the outcome? I mean, these outcomes don't happen overnight. It's a process. And mm -hmm. uh, of course, over the years, now we can see that the third, second, third, and now the fourth, the granddaughters of those members mm -hmm. are coming into the movement. And you can see the difference between the grandmother and these young girls, you know, uh, the kind of exposure they have had, the kind of uh, benefits they have had, because there was some kind of investment made in their family be it their mm -hmm. livelihood, be it their employment, be it their income, be it their childcare, be it their health, be it their housing, you know, just having a proper roof on their head or having a good door and a window in their uh, one room, you know, 10 by 10 space or having a toilet in there or having, you know, a, a, a privilege of a faucet just to tap in their house. These little things, you know, mattered a lot in bringing up those family to this level. So I think this is one of our biggest milestones to bring about a change. It's all about mm. making a change. And this change can only happen if we change and we are able to change the mindsets of the society. Agree. You've achieved so much, ma'am. Um, do you think that you, were, you have had to go through more challenges than maybe your male counterparts would have to? Oh, yes, of course. I think, uh, you know, we all know it's, it's, it's their world. Mm. Uh, um, be, you, you may be from whichever class, whichever caste, whichever ethnic group, whichever religion. Uh, well, there is always a gap. But the, ba the gap becomes much more wider if you're poor. Mm. Yeah, because that's, uh, that's the kind of... Uh, uh, it cuts across like all the class caste and the ethnicity of us. Um, and here I would say that although I was from a different class, but yes, when you start to work with the poor and you start to work with certain communities, certain background of people, uh, the challenge becomes much more bigger because uh, the way you represent them people don't trust you. Uh, and also because you have a certain value system to follow. Now, you know, in our organization, we have a very strict value system and um, our elders and our founders. And even today, the Gandhian philosophy of truth, nonviolence, communal harmony, Swadeshi, respecting your own country's values, your culture, it's still very strong. Now, with that kind of culture, you know, as a woman, you would still try to hold on to it. As a mother, you would like to hold on to them. As a, you know, as a coordinator, you would like to hold on to them. But I think uh, it's more challenging for us because we try to hold on to them and still try to move forward. Whereas for a male mm -hmm. member, it would not be like that, you know to work with the bureaucracy to work with uh, the to work with the the village infrastructure to work with the uh, all kinds of you know i mean it starts from home uh, so those challenges are really uh, quite difficult to make uh, people understand and for men because i think they are more mobile they are more exposed and uh, sometimes they can use whatever you know tactics they want to and even drift apart from uh, those kind of value system it becomes more difficult for women the second thing i would say is also uh, uh, i wouldn't say it's a challenge i wouldn't say it's a burden but as women we have to be more superpowered you know multitasking all the time 
which is very challenging. And in this kind of work, which has no fixed times, which has, you know, you just have to, you just have to jump. That's it. Mm. And if you swim, it's okay. If you don't, then, you know, it does not work. So it's been quite challenging when we have tried to bring not only us, but even our members, our leaders, our organizers out of the system. Uh, the challenge was much more great because you had to uh, build that trust mm -hmm. with people who had been exploited for so many years. So that was very, very challenging. And I think for male, maybe it would have been easier. But for women, it was much more difficult to be believed, to be trusted and still to show. I mean, we had to always perform and show a result a positive mm. result, you know? So, yeah, that was uh, some challenge. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. second challenge, I think, uh, which all women face is when it comes to numbers and statistics. You know, mm -hmm. everybody thinks that the women, uh, maybe, you know, they, and especially when you're doing a micro enterprise or doing a small business, that women will not be able to do it. So, it's uh, another so, challenge. You're, I mean, you're always on the go. You've been in this field for what, 30 years, like more than two decades now. So how do you keep yourself at the top of your game every day? There's so much that you're doing. Uh, what we have learned is that uh, always keep the poor women in the center. So you are focused. And... Uh, um, there are days when you feel uh, that, you know, uh, things are not very good because in this kind of work, you take one step forward, but there are 10 steps backward also. But at the same time, I think the best thing is that you think about the most vulnerable person you have met. And that brings you back to the focus to work for what you have to work. So mm -hmm. that gives you the power and that gives you the strength to go on. Mm -hmm. So if I trace back to 30 years ago, to if we compare it to today, uh, what are like, how do you observe the growth of women in the industry now? What changes do you see? Well, a lot of changes have happened. In fact, in our organization itself, like I said, you know, we have the third generation of membership coming in. So uh, the exposure is much more different. Even among the very poor working class families, uh, the uh, mobility has increased. Uh, some In some areas, the education and the skills have increased. And... Uh, uh, Oh, well, they, they, the grasping power has increased much more than what their mothers or grandmothers were going through. So that is there. And, and yes, of course, it's not just exposure, but it's also because the infrastructure has changed today. Mm -hmm. And because of the kind of exposure and the use of uh, very easily available information is there. Uh, accessible you know they, they can access they can have access to it I think you can see a big difference in what it was 30 years back and what it is today the second thing that you see even among very poor families is that the girls of girls today they have their own mind you know mm. I mean she is aspiring to do something different and she can speak her speak out for what she wants which maybe, you know, 30 years back or even 15 years back, uh, our uh, members would not be able to do it. But today she's more vocal. She has access to certain things and she's much more exposed. But at the same time, I think what we really have to work upon is that in the last few years, although they have risen to a certain level, there are certain areas where we are now going backwards also. And uh, here you see a big difference amongst the older generation and the present generation, whereas that generation was, you know, fearless. Mm -hmm. Fearless. You know, they would do it. If they, if they were given the opportunity, they would do it. But today, the kind of stories that you hear in the media or wherever, uh, there is a kind of, uh, uh, you know, 
a tendency of families, the same mothers who were themselves very fearless to do certain things, do not want the same things to happen with their daughters. So there we have to work a lot on some of the uh, traditional things, the customs that we are, which are coming back. Now here I'm referring to certain social customs. You know, I mean, some years back we were talking about child marriage and we were talking about certain caste issues, but coming back now, it's, you know, rising in certain communities to which you have to work. Of course, our focus as an organization is more on the economic, but then the social issues also take you behind sometimes. So mm -hmm. uh, on one side, whereas you're very happy to see the present generation, if you give them the right direction and the good value system, they are much more, much more, I would say, um, they would leap. They would leap in front of their grandmothers. But at the same time, to keep the value system strong and to keep that, uh, you know, understanding of, of what are traditions and culture, the positive side, I think we have to work a lot on that. Okay. Hmm. And how would you define an empowered woman? For me, I think, you know, the word empowerment is when a woman herself, she starts making decisions. When she starts making decisions first at the household level, if she can say that my daughter will go to school, I will not let my daughter get married before a certain age. Or if I'm earning, the money is going to be used only for this. I mean, when you start making very simple decisions first at the household level, then comes the stage when you can make the same decisions for your enterprise, collective mm. decisions. If I'm holding a position in an enterprise or an organization, I can take a collective decision with keeping everybody together. Mm. That's important. The third stage is when she starts understanding that I am, you know, I am a person who has a name, who has an existence. I have an identity of my own. You know, here in Gujarati, we say Nam Kam Gam. Your name, your work, and your place. These three things are very important for a woman also. It's not just simple introduction, but it's your identity. Hmm. When she starts understanding the worth of her identity and the contribution she's making at the household level, at the society level, at the country level, at the regional level, because she has a big contribution to the GDP of any country. So that is empowerment to represent yourself, to represent the cause of not just yourself then, but to see it at a very large, uh, you know, in a larger context. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. And what advice would you like to share with today today's women entrepreneurs or anyone aspiring to be, you know, in the same sphere as you? Uh, patience. One is that uh, for any enterprise, uh, we first have to say that we can do it. Uh, you know, we have to just tell ourselves first that we can do it. Uh, we can get the support of the people who we need if we try. It is possible. And uh, the third thing is that uh, we have to have a very competitive spirit wow. uh, and go into the field. And for that, if we have to learn something, we should do that. Only then we can be successful, you know, women and And we have seen that here in the Seva family itself, there are women who are managing a bank, they are managing a health cooperative. They are managing a child care cooperative. They are managing housing and infrastructure. They are managing all kinds of traditional, you know, embroidery groups, collectives. They are managing all kinds of dairy cooperative, that is milk cooperatives. They are managing cooperatives which are doing agriculture work from farm to, you know, plate, 
all the, those kind of businesses that come into that value chain are handled by the women. But it is only when we start understanding ourselves, our worth, and how we are contributing to an enterprise. I think that will make a change in the women-led enterprises. Women-led. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what would you say is your success mantra? Success mantras is, one is that you have to keep on keeping on. <laughs> and the second is that if you allow uh, others to lead, you are a good leader. Hmm. Great. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. It was lovely talking with you.